I'm Ellie and welcome to BBC School Report at Wyndham College. Hello and I'm Serena. Our top story tonight relates to the current issues in the Congo. Then, is the reconstruction of Norfolk roads enough to save people's cars? After that, how bad will the East Anglian drought get? We then find out that science has been transformed for one week of the year. Next, old people's playgrounds are being constructed. Are the government wasting money? Then we investigate in, is literacy in schools getting worse? After that, how will a proposed bypass benefit travellers to London? Then, three women from Wyndham College, can they become the next princess? Or will they be swept off their feet by the locals? First up, we'll pass you to Daisy, who's examining the state of Norfolk's roads. Hi, I'm Daisy, reporting for the BBC School Report. It was announced this morning that the government spent £90 million last year, repairing 1.7 million potholes. But has this really been effective? Potholes are often called a driver's worst enemy. So I went to the market town of Attleborough to interview the public about their views on this. How serious are the problems with potholes becoming, in your opinion? I've had to serious suspension damage before. Thank you very much. Not a problem at all. Very dangerous in lots of cases. Have you ever experienced any problems with your car due to them? When I had a car, yes I did. Especially with the steering. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. The, more you, the more you tell people, the, the, the more that, that, that appears. It's terrible. Terrible. Have you ever experienced any problems with your car? Uh, yeah. Um, the, the offside, the offside wheel. I uh, have to have all the uh, stuff put in for it. It cost me just over £100 uh, because of it. I'm speaking to David Mortar from David Mortar Car Servicing, a local mechanic, about the problems caused by potholes. What kinds of problems can occur as a result of potholes? Uh, the, tour, the wheel will bend creating a puncture. And how much can it cost to repair this damage? Depends on the sort of car. The general cost is about £100 per wheel. How effective is the council's current method of patching and mending the potholes? Quite effective. Okay, thank you very much. So, in summary, the increasing number of potholes has become a significant danger to motorists. We feel it should be addressed as quickly as possible before the problem worsens. Back to you in the studio, Serena and Ellie. Thank you, Daisy. Our next story is from Owen, reporting live in East Anglia about the recent and future droughts. With agriculture such a vital industry to our region, the recent announcement of an official drought period in the East is not the best news we could have anticipated. The effect it will have on both farmers and everyday consumers is perhaps even more startling. In 2010, the 10 year average for rainfall in Norfolk alone was recorded at 25 inches, yet 2011 only saw 16.3 inches. This east will also see a hose pipe ban. And although the past few days have seen a little rain, it is nowhere near enough to support the coming days, weeks, and months that are traditionally the dry months of the year anyway. The effect of this lack in rainfall are widespread amongst the regions affected, with many farmers choosing not to plant onions, carrots or potatoes as a result. I spoke to Michael Garrett, a local farmer from Garveston in Norfolk, to see what he had to say about the matter. Well, it's affected me by last harvest yields were down by 25%, uh, which wasn't reflected in the increase in price, but it, it was in so it affected me with the fact that I didn't have so much money to spend, so I didn't have a new tractor this year. And um, how, will, how will this drought affect everyday consumers as a result? Well, I think gradually prices will go up if yields keep decreasing as they are. Um, people are cutting back on acreages of high input crops like potatoes, onions and carrots that they grow. So they'll be less available to the consumer, so obviously the price will go up. When we contacted Anglia Water, they told us they were working on a long-term plan to conserve the water we do get. But what do members of the public think of the issue? What do you think about this hose pipe ban? Uh, I think it's good, because you know, some people do take the mickey with their hoses, especially ones that have their paws and they tip it out the same day and then fill it up again. If we've got no water, we've got to look after it, haven't we? So, that's my opinion anyway. I don't like the hose pipe ban because I, I can't use my water and my grass will die, my plants won't look nice and I'll also have a dirty car. 
Clearly, this drought has been and will continue to be devastating for the farmers and everyday consumers alike, with agriculture playing such a vital part in our community. However, the fundamental question that needs to be asked is this. What steps are going to be taken next time something like this happens in order to conserve the water that we do have and stop it having such a drastic effect? This was Owen for the BBC School Report. Thank you, Owen. Our next story is live from Science Week. Has the Science and Engineering Week changed your opinion of science? Yeah, it's given a variety to our lessons. It made it more interesting and fun. What activities have the students been doing? Okay, so Monday they were um, doing some Mythbusters activities, so what happens when the poop hits the fan. So they were making up different samples of poo and they were testing the stickiness, the density, they were looking at how much it would compress and they were throwing it with little catapults at small targets to see what happens and they were choosing your, their favourite poo and throwing it at the fan to see what happens. And we had some that bounced on the roof of the tent. I think they're still up there somewhere. And we had the guys from Science Made Simple and we were doing about sound waves and what happens with a sound wave and why we can hear music and about being able, how record players worked and how sound was emitted that way. On Tuesday we were doing Mythbusters again. Yesterday we had an event for the sixth formers called My Future in Science and Engineering and we had different speakers in and they were talking to the students about their options when they finished their A-levels. And we, uh, today, we have got rockets in the afternoon and the John Innes Centre in Norwich are in doing gels and the students are basically creating gels and looking at different samples and they're doing paternity tests. That's the, that's the sort of brief. And then tomorrow we're doing Coca-Cola powered cars. So we're putting Mintos into Coke and the Coke's exploding, pushing a acrylic rod like a piston at a wall, pushing a whole cart forward. So we're going to make a mess in here. Is the week designed to get students more interested in science and engineering? Yep, yeah, and also to do things that we don't usually get time to do. So having time to set 24 rockets off, we wouldn't be able to do that in an hour normally. But because we've got the tent and we've got more space, we're able to do things. And also making it more fun so students see the other side of science as well. Has the school taken part in this event before? Yep, this is our third year of doing National Science Week and we won an award this year for um, continual um, activities and being able to offer lots of stuff to our students rather than just doing one day. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Well, that was certainly fascinating. Now to Nancy about the elderly people's playground in Norfolk. Thank you, Serena. I'm here in Ashborough at Gamers Park, which hosts a playground specifically designed for the elderly. The purpose of the park is to improve the amount of physical exercise that the elderly are getting, as well as encouraging them to leave the house and socialise more. But though, at a steep price, is, it, is the equipment here really worth money? <laughs> so, it does seem a bit of a waste of money to me, to be true, truthful. Um, um, it, it's a nice idea, but I think... It, at this particular time, I think it could be possibly spent better. Well, it's, I presume it's for the benefit of Attleborough, and presumably Attleborough money has been spent on it. Mm. And I have seen it used uh, by, you know, different ages, so I suppose if it helps towards the health of people, uh, it's, it's okay. This old gentleman certainly got into the swing of things, watched on by an appreciative audience. We found two businessmen working off their greedy business lunch. And some people were better than others. From being here today at Gamers Park, we have gathered mixed reactions from the locals. But overall, people will get on the equipment if they have a little bit of encouragement. I'm Nancy, reporting for BBC Sunday News. Now, is literacy in schools getting worse? Probably not. Over to Robert, who discusses the issue with Wyndham College Principal Melvin Rock. The government warned us that he'd pull no punch, and they've been proved right. The new Chief Inspector of Schools, Sir Michael Wilshaw, produces yet another damning verdict in the state of our education. This time, his criticism is directed at literacy, as he claims that too many pupils fall behind. I think it's time to get an opinion from our principal, Mr Rock. 
Speaking as both a principal and an English teacher, do you agree with the Chief Inspector of Schools when he says that too many pupils have fallen behind in literacy? The level of literacy. Um, so to that extent, I think he's right. That, uh, you know, we, it should be something which is, if not taken for granted, that at least most students should be able to do it. Where I think he's probably uh, getting it wrong is to necessarily blame schools for the fact that a lot of too many students don't have the literacy skills that they should have. Thank you. Do you think there is any evidence that literacy is any further behind than other subjects, like numeracy or science? I think that's probably not the point he's making. I think the point he's making is that in a way, you can't improve science and, and maths, for example, if you don't have good literacy skills. So literacy is the skill which build, which is the foundation, really, for the others that are built on it. Do you think the inspectors are being too critical? Could it be argued that they're just trying to make jobs for themselves? I think there may well, very well may be a bit of that. Um, as I say, I think the, the mistake is for Ofsted and for the inspectors to blame schools for what actually is a major change in society. Over to Owen, who describes the situation with a recently convicted Congolese warlord. I'm Owen, and I'm reporting here today for BBC School Report on the topic of the recent charging of the Congolese warlord, Thomas Lubanga. Thomas Lubanga was found guilty of using child soldiers in his militia. Lubanga was found guilty by the International Criminal Court. He becomes the first person convicted by the International Criminal Court after almost 10 years of being established. Lubanga used children as sex slaves and bodyguards. He also turned them into ruthless killers. He's recruited large quantities of child soldiers for a conflict in northeast Cook of the Congo, which massacred over 50,000 soldiers and civilians in the Ituri region alone. Lubanga has a degree in psychology and at one point had recruited over 3,000 child soldiers. He has finally now been convicted for using children under 15 for enlisting them in activities in hostilities and Lubanga has been brought to justice. I asked the public what they thought about child soldiers. I'm very much against it. I think it's appalling why a child should have to fight with guns and kill each other is just terrible, really. I don't, I don't know what. It's just outrageous. Uh, I don't like the idea at all. I have seen it um, uh, many years ago. Uh, French, Hindu, Chinese um, were doing it. And I, I, you know, I met these kids at uh, 12 years old, we were taken up on floats to get them used to fly, that was with the RAF, and, uh, but, uh, you no, know, it, it's, not, it's not a nice thing to see. I think that having child soldiers in countries is wrong. I think the idea of having child soldiers is wrong. I think that children should be in school learning and playing and not fighting wars. So, in summary, the public agree that Thomas Lubanga was rightly convicted and also that child soldiers should not be allowed under any circumstances or in any countries. They also believe that child, child soldiers are a very bad idea due to the fact that they should be in school and learning. So, thanks. I'm Owen, reporting for BBC School Report at Wyndham College. Thanks. Back to Ellie and Serena in the studio. And finally, we have found a future princess from Wyndham College. Marrying a prince. You think that girls would be falling over themselves for that perfect fairy tale ending. However, Prince Harry confessed at the end of his Jubilee tour in Brazil that the idea of a royal life sends them running. And it is more about finding someone willing to take it on than anything else. With ex-girlfriends such as Caroline Flack and Florence Brudenell Bruce, some girls would be intimidated. But through some surprisingly easy investigation, we have interviewed some potential marriage material. What are your qualities? I'm bubbly, outgoing, and I love champagne. Why do you want to marry Prince Harry? Because he's the fittest ginger I know. Does the prospect of a royal life scare you? Yeah, a little bit, but I'm sure I could get used to it. Can you handle that kind of relationship? Well, the question is, is whether he could handle me. Do you like the idea of marrying a prince who is also an army serviceman? 
You get the best of both worlds, I guess. Um, uniform and a bit of fame, too. Why do you want to marry Prince Harry? Because he's fit. <laughs> Does the prospect of a royal life scare you? No, not at all. Can you handle that kind of relationship? Of course, I'm meant to be the centre of attention. Do you like the idea of marrying a prince who is also an army serviceman? Who wouldn't want a man in uniform? What are your qualities? Um, I like going to watch the horse racing, um, I like going to parties, I'm bubbly and I'm always up for a laugh. Why do you want to marry Prince Harry? Um, well, the, um, I want the better brother and also Will's already taken. Does the prospect of a royal life scare you? No, um, I always like being in the limelight and I just like being spoiled. <laughs> We also had three boys who thought they were a better match for our princesses. What are your qualities? I'm thoughtful and caring. I'm level 56 on cold. I'm a complete romantic. <laughs> Why are you better than Prince Harry? Because I've got a better body. I'm the whole package, really. <laughs> I've got normal coloured hair. Describe the perfect date. Chinese and a bit. Bowling in Nando's. Oh. So, Your Royal Highness, we have found three young eligible princesses for you, but unfortunately you have some stiff competition as well. This is Serena reporting from Wyndham College. So from Serena and from Ellie, thank you for watching. Goodbye.